and what the TSA is. Um, in 2001, the Turtle Survival Alliance was created uh, to combat what we deem uh, at the time as the Asian turtle crisis. Uh, about 95% of, of the species of turtle in, in Southeast Asia were headed towards extinction at the time. Some of those uh, animals are actually extinct in the wild currently. And our group was put together to either breed them in captivity so that we actually have the species still in perpetuity and or start programs where we can breed them and release them if the, the, if the, the meeting you know, if, if, if with the countries um, was successful. So the Turtle Survival Alliance started in Asia. Then we realized that turtles are having issues everywhere. Actually, turtles are the number one vertebrate headed towards extinction. Of the 328 species of turtles, over half of them are, fed, are, are IUCN listed, threatened, endangered. Um, as I said, some of them are actually extinct in the wild currently. So the Turtle Survival Alliance works in Southeast Asia, Madagascar, South America, all over the world, including the United States. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that our turtles actually face a lot of issues. And I run the, the Turtle Survival Alliance's North American Research Group, where we do long-term analysis of populations that should be healthy. So we work in a lot of state parks, state preserves across the country, Florida, Texas, Tennessee, Indiana, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. And we target usually areas that should have an abundance of turtles and usually every species. Some of our sites, we um, gear towards one species or other, depending on the species needs. In Pennsylvania, we only do one species, and that's the wood turtle, because it's a species that is being poached for, um, for pets. Another big thing uh, that turtles face are, is the illegal pet trade. So getting on to this giant here, um, we locked into this study in 2016, where we were just doing a baseline a survey for Memorial Park. We wanted to see what turtles lived in Buffalo Bayou. And we set traps, thinking we'd get the typical red ear sliders, soft shells, map turtles maybe. We got all those, but we also got six of these things. And what's really important about this western alligator snapping turtle is that this is the farthest western range of this animal. So Harris County is as far west as the western alligator snapping turtle is known from. Um, and prior to us finding it, it was not believed that they actually had a functional breeding population within Harris County. In fact, Texas Parks and Wildlife had, had uh, hired on a group to do a study in the early 2000s, and they actually skipped Harris County entirely because the habitat was not typical habitat for the species. They jumped all the way to the Brazos and didn't find them in the Brazos, so they thought everything west, um, west of uh, Harris County was really where the species stopped. So the species is the largest hard-shell species in the United States. It actually is the largest hard-shell species in the world, um, historically-wise. Uh, we have not found one in the 200-pound range in the last 30, 40 years, actually. The largest one that I know currently that has been found is a 160-pound individual that was found actually in Texas due to a poaching incident. Uh, actually, this past April, uh, two men from uh, Louisiana were found uh, with 60 of these things in the back of their truck, um, including the 160-pound male. And they actually went through federal court, court process and were, were actually given about three years in prison, I believe, due to the, the, the theft. Um, this species is extremely long-lived, uh, some 200 years estimates. Uh, so they're very much like a Galapagos tortoise and Aldabra tortoise, extremely long-lived. Um, they... As I said, they're the largest turtle in the United States, uh, which, you know, Texas, everything's bigger in Texas, which should take some pride that this thing is actually in Houston. Uh, females are usually a lot smaller than males. Uh, most turtles have sexual dimorphism that favors the female because she has to fit all the eggs inside. This is actually the opposite in this case, where a big female might get about 70 pounds. Um, that's because the males have intersexual aggression where they defend a microhabitat and or a, a female, and they will fight one another. Uh, they are fish specialists. Uh, they actually have a modified lure in their mouth. It's actually their tongue. So they will actually sit in their little microhabitat, their little hollow, their, their little cut bank, with their mouth wide open, and that tongue is dangling in the water column. Brings in the fish. They also have been known to eat carrion occasionally. Um, they do have a bite pressure of over 1,000 pounds per square inch. So that whole wives' tale about snapping turtles being able to break uh, broom handles and whatnot, this thing can. Uh, a common snapper can't. So um, this is the actual range of the species prior to 2014, where they were from the Suwannee River in Florida 
all the way to Harris County area on up to, into Illinois, Indi in Indiana. On 2014, this species is actually, was actually acceptedly broken into three through morphological analysis and genetic analysis. Three distinct species came out of this study. And those three, basically, you have the Suwannee River that occurs now in Florida, the Apalachicola, which occurs from Panhandle of Florida all throughout um, Mississippi, and then you have the western that it takes on from western Mississippi onto uh, Texas and Oklahoma. That's the one that lives here. Um, they uh, love tannin, turbid rivers. That is what they're known from. Uh, the Mississippi River, the Mobile River, Trinity, Sabine, big river systems, not bayou systems. That's probably why the original study in the early 2000s, they skipped um, Harris County in general because we don't really have the typical habitat. Um, they don't really move very much uh, from what it's been found, so they, they like the area they're in. So that can lend to the species having some severe issues depending on habitat quality and habitat loss. So uh, it's really hard to see, but what's really interesting is um, here's Harris County, of course. We, the species is known from all eastern Texas, but there are no county records for Montgomery, Waller, um, Fort Bend, Bra uh, Brazoria, uh, Galveston. There's no county records of the species at all within the Harris County range. So right now what we're doing with our study that we lucked upon was, is that we are doing Buffalo Bayou, because that's where we actually locked upon finding them in, but the whole drainage of Buffalo Bayou. Right now we know that they are within Greens. We know that they are in Cypress Creek. Uh, we know that they are within nine miles of Buffalo Bayou. So here's a, 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 a shot of what Buffalo Bayou currently, um, what, what Buffalo Bayou looks like. We have trapped them basically from Sabine Street to Woodway, and we have 45 marked individuals now within about two years of time. And that might not seem a lot, but it is. It's actually a, a lot. That's a breeding functional population. We have a two and a half pound individual to a 109 pound male. And we have a bunch of adult females and, and males from 80 pounds on up in between that. So they are persisting. They are somehow figuring out how to live, still live in Buffalo Bayou, which I would not consider a great habitat. Um, they are nesting because we have a bunch of juveniles. I have no idea where they're nesting because Buffalo Bayou is surrounded by million dollar houses and areas and you know, a typical urban sprawl and construction. Uh, right now though, we actually got three weeks ago, uh, Terry Hershey Park I believe is right over here. We got a, a pedestrian that sent us a video of a giant, probably bigger than my 109 pound individual walking the trail at Bu uh, Terry Hershey Park right down to Buffalo Bayou. And then, of course, the rains hit, and we got four inches of rain throughout Houston, which made Buffalo Bayou raise eight feet. So I can't trap during that time period. I have to wait for the bayou to go down. We set these long 10-foot, 4-foot wide hoop net traps. We bait them with fish, and we do that. We try to do it monthly. And um, if Buffalo Bayou, of course, is too high, they can't do it. Turtles drown pretty easily. Well, these big guys can maybe hold their breath for about 45 minutes. So conditions have to be right. To make sure that the traps are set right so you don't draw any turtles. Uh, but if we do get him, that will give us 22 total miles of Buffalo Bayou that we know they're within. So this is going, it goes back to my original um, why TSA was created. And this particularly is the issues that this species faces, is poaching. It is the largest turtle in the country, the hard, largest hard shell turtle in the world. Uh, and it's used as meat. Uh, a lot of cultures eat turtle. And unfortunately, there's an uh, unsustainable um, uh, you know, want for this meat. They, turtles are very long-lived organisms, meaning uh, they're very akin actually to people. They have delayed sexual maturity. So an adult female alligator snapping turtle might take 10 to 15 years to become reproductive. So if you're taking adult females out of the population and putting them in dump trucks like that, you're going to crash the population instantly. They can't deal with it. They're not fish. Fish become reproductive within months. Um, they take, as I said, almost 15 years, if not longer, for some species. Some species don't even become reproductive into their 20s. So um, we, are, we face this on a constant daily uh, basis where species are being shipped to China, to Southeast Asia, for this meat trade, for pet trade. Uh, actually, uh, about 
five months ago, we had a confiscation in Madagascar for the plowshare tortoise. It's a little tortoise about that big. Beautiful tortoise. We found 11,000 of them in a house in Madagascar that was ready to be shipped to China. We saved about 10,200 of them. We had an army of veterinarians and TSA people sent over there for the last four months. There's actually people still over there dealing with them. They're hard releasing them as, as we can. So uh, studying species, uh, species like this is important because they're so long lived. They're, they have such delayed sexual maturity. Uh, and we, we just don't know a lot about them, even though they're in our backyards. Uh, no one had ever thought they would be in an urban setting. This is the only urban population known in Houston right now. We have people in Dallas, Fort Worth actually have caught two now in the da downtown Dallas area simply because they thought, why not look? We found them here. So um, when you break a species into three from one, uh, that map I showed you earlier, originally in 2014 prior, alligator snapping turtles were one recognized species. They are now three recognized species. They are still not federally protected. Uh, Prior to 2014, they were thought to have been uh, in need of that. And now that you've uh, officially broken them into three separate species, three separate breeding populations and genetic populations, they really probably should be. And unfortunately, at this point, we're relying on state protections, which um, don't do a lot in a lot of instances. Um, so this is just some really cool pictures of the species. This is the judge. He, this, uh, he is a 136-pound individual from, from uh, the Suwannee River in Florida. It's my friend from the Florida Fish and Wildlife, Eric Suarez, who's holding him. This is one of our 90-pound individuals that was caught right at Bayou Bend in Gardens in Memorial Park. That is George Heinrich, one of our surveyors that's, uh, that's kneeling over him after we caught him. Um, the, the differences between the species really is, is genetics and morphological. They probably still could reproduce, so you get the whole idea of what really is a species. But if you put the judge in, and our big guy side by side, they look remarkably different morphologically and genetically. Um, we are, as I said, finding a breeding population within Buffalo Bayou, which uh, to this day still amazes me. I figured, okay, we'd find a bunch of old individuals. They wouldn't be successful, but they are being successful. These things were probably five years old. We have found some there two pounds. There, there would just be a two, three-year-olds. Um, so somewhere, somehow, they're actually finding a place to nest. And that is actually our next part of the study, is I have 10 transmitters now that once the bayou goes down, we are able to trap again. I'll be putting transmitters on some females, and we'll be tracking them to see where the females are going within the Buffalo Bayou system. See where, if at all, they're getting out, because it's kind of late for nesting at this point, but they still could have a last nest. See uh, where they're picking, and if they go back year after year. It would be interesting, because that would be an area that we would have to figure out how to conserve. <clears throat> uh, the whole bio, the Buffalo Bayou um, system issue, um, why it takes so long to figure this out, that they're here, is that no, the habitat just doesn't match what they're, what they're um, you know, in, in textbooks and what people consider prime habitat for the species. But if you go through the Houston Chronicle or year after year after year after flood events, you always find articles that say people found them in their pools. You people have found them washed up in their backyards. So we have known that they've been here, but it's just never clicked that they actually might have a functioning population. What's really important about that, popu that functioning population is turtles, by and large, are now considered what are called a keystone species. Um, some aspect of their life history impacts other species' life histories to a high degree. And the alligator snapping turtle is one of those because the alligator snapping turtle actually is an ecosystem engineer. They dig out cut banks. Other things use those dig outs. They, they are voracious eaters, so they, to get that size, they have to eat a lot, and they do, uh, of, of various species. We actually know in Buffalo Bayou that they're actually eating the, uh, the armored catfish, the invasive species, because we've baited our traps with those. <laughs> what about Asian I've not baited my traps with those yet, but I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, they eat tilapia, too, and they're in Buffalo Bayou. Uh, problem uh, with them being in an urban setting, though, is also the times you have impact and you have death. This is the largest animal that we know of in Buffalo Bayou, only because we caught his shell and we did a dead weight. This was before we did the study. This was in 
I believe in early 2016. The, cor the, the corpse was sent to uh, um, the, the museum in Dallas-Fort Worth where one of our guys, Carl Franklin, uh, he's the curator of the Hurt Museum uh, for the university up there. He did a dead weight and he did morphological shells. We still have the shell and the skull and everything. But that guy at dead weight was 136 pounds, a big male, probably 90, 100, 100 years old. Uh, and when he did the necropsy, he had a, uh, a line of tr uh, trout line down his throat. Yeah. And that is actually considered the number one detriment to this species in the United States other than poaching is trout, is trout line use. Uh, and just, just another article showing another large male being caught in somebody's backyard after a flooding event. And then another one stuck in a drainage pipe in, in, in Harris County. So when this is prior to our study, but now um, with the help of T Kelly Nord and uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, they usually, I usually get a call of, uh, from Kelly saying, we have an alligator snapping turtle that's found. Uh, we'll re and if there is a water body in, within the vicinity of it, it gets released there, of course. Uh, with the one that was found in the drainage pipe, we tagged it and we actually released it in Buffalo Bayou because we don't know exactly where it came from. Um, so, where was I at? I'm sorry. The research needs going forward for this species and this population are, is just continued actual expansion of the study currently. Uh, it's only two years in of a 10 year pro uh, program. Um, 45 individuals and nine miles. Buffalo Bayou is 50 miles. We want to go all the way to Fort Bend and, and further. Fort Bend would be the range extension for this species. And if they're in Fort Bend, they could very well be in Brazos. Um, the study back in the early 2000s uh, trapped at the Brazos River for three nights and said that they didn't catch any, so they didn't think they would be there. I, that's nowhere near enough. Uh, I have no doubt that they, they, pro they very well could be there. Um, there. There are perfect days where we're tr we set traps out and we're thinking we're going to get a bunch of turtles, and we don't. Then we have days that they're, why are we trapping? We catch six in one trap. It's just, you, know, you never know. Um, we would like to do genetic analysis. We're actually pairing with a university in Missouri who studies these in Missouri and Oklahoma. Uh, they want to see what the genetic uh, variability is between the species out this region because even though they were broken into three, a lot of people actually think they could actually be broken further into six. And sim that's simply because they are, live in the same region, pretty much in the same habitats of uh, is the map turtle genus, the Graptomys turtles, and all of those are river endemic. So we're thinking maybe these things could be very similar. They could be river endemics, and that would be really interesting in that we have an urban population outside of a major river. Um, what are their genetics like compared to like the Trinity River, the Sabine River? Um, so really, uh, Going forward is doing all that and doing a long-term um, monitoring population, uh, long-term population monitoring and movement study. We actually have 10 transmitters. Eventually, I would like to get a graduate student to do more. 10 is not enough to really get a really good idea of how things are moving within, within such a big area, Buffalo Bayou. And then branching off to the Buffalo Bayou tributaries, Cypress Creek and Greens Bayou and Brays, all the major arteries in, in, in the Harris County area getting out into Montgomery County, Waller County, Galveston County, Brazoria, and filling in that rainbow, uh, that crescent around Harris County, because they're in Harris County, they're gonna be in the others. Um, that's, that's just a map of where we currently know they're from. So Sabine Street, we have a 45 pound female, and Woodway and, and 610, we have a 109 pound male. And in between, we have 43 others that range from two and a half pounds to 100 pounds. Um, we've really gone over most of that. It, it really is intriguing. Oh, actually, this is a pretty neat picture. This was uh, back last January. This is a 90-pounder, and this is 102. At that point, they were our two big boys. They were in the same trap with a 17-pounder. We had 200 pounds of turtle on trap. Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a fun day getting them out because you're trying to get these two turtles that are stronger than me and Carl put together out of a net. It, it made, yeah, it's exhausting. <laughs> Uh, at that time, um, we had 20 adult males, 12 adult females, and 8 juveniles, which really shows a really good population. It's, it's close to one-to-one, -one, what you really want to see for male and female. 
and a healthy dose of juvenile is added in. So somehow it, they're making it work. Uh, a lot of turtles are have um, when they lay eggs, the eggs aren't uh, the sex isn't determined by the actual female. It's determined by temperature. So a lot of areas that are urban have issues with too much sunlight. So it's going to direct a population to go one sex or the other. And it doesn't seem to be doing that here, which is great. Um, future focus uh, really is, is, as I mentioned earlier, um, just continuing what we're doing, trying to get more, more people out to help us. So volunteers are always welcome. That's really what the Turtle Survival, Survival Alliance is all about, is volunteerism. Uh, we can't do the work that we have without it. I get students from across the country, volunteers from every walk of life to come out and enjoy the turtles, seeing what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, to get more studies, uh, com uh, collaboration with people like Day Ligon, who's that, that professor up in Missouri who does genetic analysis, and uh, just really expanding the knowledge that Harris County has a dinosaur and a, a very special species. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions.